but I see. Okay, right, it's back. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, so, and, and uh, so he's complaining how it's unfair, how this, and then it's an allegory. Reason come in his jail cell. Say, what are you doing? You, you, you served me all your life doing your philosophical work, and now just because you're gonna die, even though it's unfair, you betray me, you abandon me, and you start complaining about yourself, right? And I think that's an interesting moment where he says, well, that's because you, uh, you, you have too strong uh, emotional connection to your life and you cannot accept your own finitude, the fact that we're mortal, yeah? So it's a lot like this. In fact, when people come initially, often they're emotional, they're anxious, and a big part of the work is to create some disconnection from uh, whatever creates the emotion and the anxiety and take some distance from it. So yes, what uh, the philosopher does for himself to create this distance, he, he does the same thing. He invites uh, his client to do the same thing. Yeah? So he invites him himself to be, uh, to be a philosopher. And that's, by the way, one difference again with psychology. The psychology does not invite his client is patient to become psychologist, but the philosopher, yes, we, we hope that our clients will themselves become philosophy practitioner. Now, it doesn't happen so often, but in, in the absolute, that would be the hope that they as well get, in, get involved in, and that happens once in a while, not so often, but happens, when they themselves get involved in the, in the practice, yeah? Do you understand my answer? Um, but is yes, she gone? Sir. I think Thank probably, you. yeah, yeah. Yes, sir, yes, sir. I understand. Thank you so much. All right, good. Okay. I see, I see Yamini uh, wants to say something. Yamini. Okay, Yamini. So I have two questions. And the first one is about, you mentioned something about academic self and knowing self. And how do they oppose each other? Well, the academic self is a knowing self, so I don't understand. When when you're in academic world, you gotta know things. So yeah. Initially, initially you opposed the two of them in oh, your criticism okay. of academics. Yes. Okay. No, I think I okay. I meant that the self is not part of the knowledge. Yeah. That you you investigate the world, you, like you you take an uh, extra mundane position. You're outside of the world and you look at the world, but you are not part of the world. You don't examine your own life, and for me that's a big difference in philosophical practice. You cannot do philosophical practice without examining your own existence, because how can you help people to examine their own existence if you don't examine your own existence? Yeah, you know, it'd be like a a swimming teacher that doesn't swim. So, uh, but in the, when you, for example, you study the Stoics in, in academia, you don't have to be a Stoic. You just have to know a lot about Stoics. Yeah. And that's a different philosophical practice. The self is part of the experience. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but that is what I want to ask you that is this a cultural thing? Because in Indian traditions, we have been studying this that like Krishnamurti talks about being an observer and there are a lot of other philosophers who talk about being outside and they're still uh, practicing and questioning. Yeah, but, uh, I, I, but uh, Krishnamurti is not exactly an example of academic philosopher. Do, do you agree with me? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> if academic philosopher would think like Krishnamurti, the, 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 the story would be a little bit different, yes? I mean, Krishnamurti proposes some type. Uh, after that, we can uh, examine what he does and criticize whatever, but he proposes some type of philosophical practice. He makes people look at themselves. Do you agree? Yeah. Yes. He's not, uh, he's not promoting some uh, knowledge about the history of ideas, right? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. And uh, the, the second thing is that I want to ask you about that when uh, a client comes to you to be to know something new about them, like they want to be surprised. What what is supposed to be done then? Because in the general, 
Yeah, I mean, you know, most people that come to see me, they don't want to get surprised. That's that's not their, they're not people come for an intellectual adventure. It can happen, but most people, they come because they expect to solve a problem. You know, so they say, you know, my husband left me, life is terrible, what can I do? You know, <laughs> they don't want to surprise. In fact, if I surprise them, they, maybe they're not so hot about it. No, people come for consolation, for comfort, for solving, yeah, they... They want to get out of their pain, out of their anxiety. Okay, first of all. Second, on the surprise. Well, if you do your job right, in one hour consultation, necessarily you will surprise people. Because that's a bit of a sad thing to say, but most people, most human beings, are not involved in their daily life about thinking activity. Yeah, So you never need very much. Uh, before they find out. I'll give you a very stupid example about my classic, the woman, her husband left her and she's in despair. And I simply ask her, well, well do you think that uh, uh, life can be good without love? And of course, right away, no, no, love is everything, la, la, la. I say, well, let's think. And, and you know, and of course, little by little, she will think of someone or eh, something where, after all, you can live, and love is not the primary thing in life. You can, and and she's surprised because that's her own conclusion. Yeah, it's not a big revolutionary conclusion that I don't know some scientist. You know, he he's into science and love is whatever. Yeah, but she's surprised because in her mind, all the time, love with uh, is everything, and without love, uh, there's nothing, and things are meaningless. Yeah. So you will surprise people not because you want to surprise them, just because basic thinking will uh, provoke a surprise. Yeah, and, and most people are into some kind of intellectual routine. So don't worry, they'll get surprised naturally if you get them to think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think initially I got my first clients who were who came with the intention of being surprised. That's what. Well, well, you, you're lucky. It's a nice, it's it's a nice client. This this one, he's, I mean, intellectually, he's already alive. Yeah, you know, somebody wants surprise. It's a bit. It's not ordinary, right? Yes. It's a bit of a, an intellectual, right? No. And, and and do you think that we can make some observations about his thinking pattern if he's coming like for this purpose? Yeah. Well, look, everything. You know, in like in these American movies, you know, about justice, they say everything you say can be used against you. You know, this uh, thing, <laughs> these uh, police uh, stories. Well, it's a bit the same with us, except everything you say will be used for you. I mean, it might look against you, but it's for you. Yeah, whatever people come, you know, you, you're going to use it. I say, for example, your client that says... Uh, uh, I, I want to get surprised. I say, why? Uh, is your life boring? <laughs> why, why do you need surprise? What, what's, uh, you know, why suddenly you want a surprise? Yeah. So, yeah. So whatever people tell you, you can use because it's the, you use it as a mirror principle. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So everything. In fact, sometimes even people, be, be, before the people even speak, the way they handle themselves, the way they sit, I sometimes use it, you know, people sit. Yeah, so everything people do, everything they say, you can use because it's part of your understanding and what you observe about this person. Yes. Yeah. Good? Yes. All right. Good. Okay. I think we can move to the next one. Like Raja is waiting. <laughs> okay, Raja is patient. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I was stuck by something that you said in the beginning, or fairly in the beginning, and that's the claim that only the examined life is worth living. And this, uh, I'm not convinced, but I'm also not not convinced. I find this. I find this a very tough statement, yeah, yeah. Um, and I always think about. I mean, this. I mean, examining one's life is so hard. It's a lot of work, and I love it, right? And I think we all do. I mean, as philosophers, that's just part of what we love, or many of us. 
But then there's the virtuous peasant who's just humble and somehow perhaps even practices humility, um, devotion, spiritual yeah. exercises. Is that not a life worth living? Okay. Uh, okay. Well, if, if that can make you uh, uh, console you, your issue as well was my issue, you know, because when I read this, uh, I found this quite a harsh statement and I made it for myself uh, a question uh, throughout my whole uh, career doing philosophical practice, say, is it real or not real? Yeah. And so I tested, I tested many, many people. And by the way, I live in a little village on the countryside in France since a couple of years, or I retired and I live in a village and where I have peasants all around me. Well, uh, that peasant you speak about, who's humble and everything is fine. Well, I tell you, I have never met him. I, I have not met him. Generally, he's greedy. He, he is not satisfied. He wants what he doesn't have. He's envious toward the neighbor. Now, but you made a specification. You say the one that does, uh, you use, I remember exactly, you said like spiritual exercise or something like this. Well, he's already different. I remember, you know, I was raised a Catholic. And um, when I was young, we learned, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the exercise, we called it, it's in French, so I don't know in English, but we call examination of conscience, yeah? Mm -hmm. We call it examine. And what's the idea is at the end of the day, you look at your day and you say, what have I done? Was it right? Was it wrong? Well, you see, uh, it's already some sort of examination of your life. And I do think, that's a very healthy practice. And probably that's the first uh, practice I got in my youth as a child of some kind of philosophical practice. But that's very different. And I agree. If somebody, for example, uh, goes talk to the priest and discuss what he does and the priest, well, already he's thinking about his life. And I do think, yes, indeed, uh, there is a necessity. But the, the, the somebody just satisfied uh, simple with 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 humility. I have never met this in general. Humble people uh, behind there's always resentment. Uh, let's say if not always, most of the time there's always there's a humility outside, but behind you periodically you will find resentment, unless again uh, you have some from some spiritual type of exercise where he deals with his own being, yeah? So religion has provided, uh, if you look from Ignatius the Loyola, the Jesuit, and I don't know, probably in the Indian tradition, maybe you find similar thing, but there is uh, that kind of, not exactly the same, but something where you think about your life and you think uh, the conclusion of your life because there's an afterlife and what's going to happen with you the judgment of Osiris for the Egyptian, where at the end of your life, you're judged. You're the, is your soul is too heavy. It will be thrown in the mouth of a monster. So beside a purely like say, Socratic questioning, I think there are such practices in the, in the history of, of, of mankind, but it's never natural. It's not, it doesn't happen by itself. It happens because... There are people, I don't know, priests or sorcerers, whatever, who, who, who have worked on it and invite people to do it. Yeah, There's something uh, artificial. It's not natural to do that. Mm. Can I follow up on this? I, I understand what you're saying. Um, yeah, go ahead. What I am hearing is that you're turning this into an empirical question in a way, right? Or your response is empirical. You're saying, I have not met such a person. Yeah, and I, I, I agree. <laughs> I think if there are such people, then they are, they are probably very rare and perhaps even very difficult for us who are not like them to recognize. Um, but uh, so and, and then the answer that you gave or no, I should not say answer, but then you say the then you zoned in on the qualification that I made. Well, spiritual exercises. And you went to exercises that already contained a bit of conceptualization, right? Um, um, uh, examination. 
let me qualify that away and say, well, well but uh, uh, Raja, yes, you no, I don't know. I got the first part. Second part, I don't know where you're going. Can you try to do something concise? Otherwise, I don't follow you anymore. Yeah. So the virtuous peasant that I have in mind does not engage in uh, spiritual exercises that involve examination. Well, the, 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 the peasant that would do this naturally, you know, by some uh, personal process, again, I'm not saying he does not exist at all, yeah, yeah. but uh, I have never met him. And as you say, it's probably rare. Yeah. But what you have in the tradition, in different cultural tra tradition, is some people who, for their own reason, have developed some kind of competency. Often they were trained, for example, I have studied African philosophy. I've studied the Sufi tradition. I even wrote some books about it. You have the Sufi master does that, for example. But he's trained. He has a long tradition within Islam of people learning to do this and inviting people to, to do it, you see. So they are uh, in different with different techniques, different way, inviting to people to reflect on their existence. But generally, it's like uh, there is some... Uh, well, institutionalization might be a stronger, but something like that. But there's been a body of people uh, that uh, have specialized in this, yeah? And, and then they invite people to do it. But it's very rarely something that somebody will do by himself, just like that, just like being a peasant in the countryside, yeah? You know? But yes, but there's in traditions that have produced such... Uh, like I said, but Chuangzi, the Chinese, is not. He doesn't function like Socrates, but the idea is the same. Very provocative, very make people reflect about their existence. Not so much with questioning, but more uh, Asian style is through paradoxes. He makes paradoxes and he poses paradoxes to people. And then that, a bit like the Nikuan Zen, yeah, makes them think. So you do have traditions uh, in humanity besides Socrates that do this, yeah. Mm. Does that answer your question? It does to the, ex well, part of it. I don't want to drag this out. This is something that's been bothering me for quite some time. So no, uh, it's, good. It, it still <laughs> does, right? It still does because, you know, you're saying it's not natural. <laughs> and I think you're right. But even if it's not natural, would it still be worth a, a worthwhile life? Well, of course. I mean, if you tell me somebody by himself, uh, you know, he questioned me, uh, good life. I'm fine. I, I would be happy. I might be a bit sure. jealous that it's so simple for him, but good for him. Yeah. But the thing I, I'm a bit weary about is the romanticism, which is a very intellectual romanticism of the peaceful peasant. Yeah. The peaceful peasant. Uh, I mean, it's very popular in many countries and especially developed countries. We have uh, some nostalgia of a lost uh, naivete and then, you know, and yeah, okay, fine. Uh, so I, I'm a bit weary about this romanticism, about this character. And that's why, again, uh, I try to look for it. I, you know, in, in my area, I talk to a lot of peasants I periodically. But generally, yes, uh, I tell you, resentment, envy, and they look humble. At first, you speak to them, you know, I don't know, I don't humble. You check a bit behind. Envy for and greed, very strong, very strong. So uh, I'm not saying it does not exist. Uh, it's like the wise guy on top of the Himalaya. Maybe he does exist, but, you know, it, it, I don't meet him very often. But I, I do think it's an interesting issue. But as well, there, I say the romanticism of the lost, a bit a Rousseauian type, the lost uh, savage uh, goodness. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I yeah. understand that, and I I, I agree with that. Um, <laughs> that that I understand. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. Anyone else? So I have a question. Yeah. Um, so doesn't uh, di uh, interruption defeat the purpose of a dialogue? R repeat. Doesn't interruption defeat the purpose of a dialogue? Okay, that's a very interesting question, okay? 
You ready for a little exchange? <laughs> I can try. Okay. All right. Now, uh, do you ever speak to someone and at some point you think it's necessary to interrupt this person in order for the dialogue to go on? Did you ever have this experience? Yes. I what have. would be the reason why you think interrupting this person is necessary to uh, let the dialogue go on? Because they over explain. They, they what? They? They over explain. Okay, they over explain. Okay, they over explain. And what is the problem of this over explanation? They go around one topic, but they don't come to the central problem. Okay, uh, they go around, they don't come to the center problem. Now, is coming to the center problem a condition for having a real dialogue? Maybe no? not. No. Oh, you see, but maybe not is funny. You know what it means if there's a maybe not? <laughs> it means there's a maybe yes as well. <laughs> You see? Yeah, that's now don't think about some necessity. And when we when we speculate like this, don't go with, with absolutely just think what's probable. Okay, yeah, just go with what's probable. What when somebody's turning around, doesn't go to the center point, what's the probability? Is it better to stop them in order to have the dialogue go on, or is better to say, okay, just keep turning in circles? What what is you think is better? I think sometimes both is required. First, you should explain, elaborate, and you're then you you're, you're more tricky, specific. Madulika, you're a tricky woman. You heard what you heard the adverb you used again? No. Or not? You use sometimes. You didn't notice. Yeah. You see, that's the difference, by the way, with the philosopher and the client. Philosopher listens to everything. Client, no, he's only wants to express himself. Yeah. That sometimes is terrible. You know why that sometimes is terrible? It's, it's not accurate or it's not concrete? Well, well, let me put it. When sometimes you say sometimes, it rather often or rather rare? Okay. Yeah. Often Which one? Can... What? Often. Okay. For you, sometimes in often, yeah? So somebody says, I sometimes go to the movies. It means he goes five times a week to the movies, or that sounds strange. So not here, but yeah, in the context of what I was saying earlier, oh, okay. I would replace it with often. Madulika, stay with me. Don't be, I know you're, you're a tricky woman, no? Are you tricky? No, I'm, no? I don't know right okay. now who Let's I am. See. Sometimes, <laughs> don't replace. Sometimes, sometimes means rather... Rare or rather often? The word sometimes. Not you. what you want to do with it, but the word itself. Rare. 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 Okay. So I ask you what's probable. And what do you start with? Sometimes. You notice? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know I why? Know. When you ask someone what often happens, and they start with sometimes, do you know why they do that? Mm. No. No? Okay. Well, see, this typical the kind of thing you got to know when you do the practice. You mean that what happens often, they don't like very much. So they prefer to answer you with what happens sometimes, because that's more pleasant to them, the sometimes than the often. So they're tricking you by <laughs> saying not what tends to happen, but, uh, you know, like say a husband uh, says, uh, a wife complain, you, you, you don't offer me flour. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and so, yeah, I do. Well, do you often bring me flour? And husband said, well, sometimes I bring you flour. Well, sometimes I don't give a damn. That's once a month. I don't like it. You see, it's, it's uh, but these adverbs is a typical way by which we trick the, the, the discourse. Did you ever notice that? How adverbs, we use it to yeah. trick or no, you know? Yes, yes. Uh, I always give an example of my son. You know, I have three children and I ask myself, 
Did, did you hit your sister a little bit? I say, well, I don't want to know if it's a little bit or not. Did you hit your sister? You know, so adverbs is very interesting. Yeah, you know, so, yeah. So let's go back to the question. Don't trick me with the sometimes. In general, if somebody's beating around the bush and not getting to the key issue and you want to have a dialogue, is it better to stop them uh, so they go to the center, or it's better to let them speak in general? Again, I cannot pick a side. Uh, I have you a reason why. You, you, I you cannot said... pick one option, right? Because. No, no, don't, no, because, no, because. You say you okay. cannot, yeah? You say you cannot? Okay. If I'm telling you you're tricking me again, do you know why? Why? You don't know why? I have a reason. I mean, I would need to elaborate. I, it. Oh, I tell you what, my, my dear, I'm sure you have a hundred reasons, but I don't care about the reasons. You see, one thing we don't want is people to start telling you why, 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 you know, why yeah. is a, let me propose you a general idea. Why is a way to avoid the what? Why is a way to hide the what? Do you ever notice that? I have. I'll give you another example with my children. Children are used by this. But did you break the glass? And a uh, 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 doctor and said, it's because. I said, I don't want because. I want the what. Did you break the glass? I don't want the reasons, you see. But often people, they want to use reasons to avoid uh, looking at the phenomenon itself. Yeah. So yes. never mind the reason. Just you said, I cannot. Right. Yeah. You say, I cannot. You remember? Yes, I did. Is it true that you cannot or it's a lie? I think now it's a lie. Yeah, you see? You see, I spotted since the beginning how you're a tricky woman. Do you see it now? Yeah, no, I, I was, problem is I was confused. Because no, 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 Badulika, no, no, forget confusion. No, 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 no. You're, you're a smart woman. Don't now you're trying to justify with confusion. No, no, even though it's not totally conscious, you know what you're doing and you're tricky. Do you see? I showed you already three tricks you used on me. Did you notice them? I did. Adwords was one. And does that surprise you that you're tricky <laughs> or no? Uh, it does. Yeah, okay, you didn't know that, yeah? No. Nobody ever told you, friends or family, Madulika, you're tricky. Nobody ever told you? <laughs> no, they okay. have not. Okay, well, let me tell. Let me bring it from a different angle. Are you good with argumentation? I believe so. Yes. And some people that you know, who are not so good with it, can it bother them how you're good with argumentation? It does. What do they say, for example? You argue too much. Yes. And what does that mean, you argue too much? What do you think they're telling you? That I question too much? No. Argumentation is not questioning. Huh? It's you want to <laughs> prove your point. Yeah? You want to <laughs> prove. And they think you try to prove too much, right? Yeah. Is that a nice way of being tricky to try to prove too much? No. It's no, no. Well, do you know what the sophist does? You know how the what? sophist function? You don't know? Not exactly in a method. Way. Exactly. Don't worry. You like adverbs. Never mind exactly. Do you more or less know how does it, what's it, no? Well, he, he has a hundred arguments. One of the sophists Socrates speaks to, he says, I could sell anything to anyone, yeah? Why? Because he's powerful with arguments. And people, and same with politicians, with lawyers, if you're really good with argumentation, you can manipulate people. Did you know this? Yes. And you're good with argumentation. Now right? I feel that I am, uh, now I feel it's not a good quality. No, because no, no, no. But you see, don't do that. Never mind good or bad. You see, that's not the issue. The issue is you are you have a functioning mind. Yes, you agree? Yes. 
Yeah. Uh, from the little I speak to you, I can tell you have a functioning mind and you're good with argumentation, right? Right. And when you want to get what you want, uh, you make arguments and you're probably good at it, right? Yes. You see how this can be called tricky. Yes. It's a technique. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. Now, good or bad, it's not my issue. Then you decide if you don't like it, then stop doing it. If you, but it's as well a form of power, of intellectual power. Yeah? Yeah? Yes. Yes. So you reconcile it with your tricky side. I did. <laughs> yes. You do. Yeah. But it can be an advantage when you can be criticized. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so the idea, again, try to... Uh, so when you said I cannot, of course you can uh, decide, right? I can, yes. Well, then tell me what would you rather do? If somebody beats around the bush, he doesn't go to the heart of things, would you rather interrupt him to get uh, what's the real issue or you prefer to let them speak? Come to the issue quickly. Okay. For that. So you might interrupt them. Good. Hmm. And Isn't you answer, reflection a better option to reflect wait, your wait, thoughts wait, wait, after they have finished? One, one thing at a time. One thing at a time. Okay. Do you see that you answered your own yes. question? Yeah, I did. Huh? Nice. It was, yes. Are you happy you answered your own question? <laughs> yeah, I'm convinced and happy and uh, okay. surprised right. too. Yeah. Yeah, well, surprise, like I say, is our trademark <laughs> to surprise people. Okay, but now you see, like with, uh, uh, I, now I don't remember her name, my first uh, friend, uh, uh, maybe Rachel, after, yes. yeah, after answering that, maybe there's a new problem. And then we deal it separately. But at least you answer your initial question. Why would it be better to interrupt people? Because they're beating around the bush and you want to go to the heart of the matter. Okay. First, yes. first answer, answer to first question. But now is there a new problem that pops up to your mind after giving that answer or no? Yes, there's another question. Go ahead. Uh, I felt that interruption can be a little rude. So yeah. is it- Stop, 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 stop. Just, just, just stop. No, not so much. Just repeat it. You repeat I what you feel just- I observed that yeah. interruption can be a little rude way okay. to break a sentence. Do you notice you change your speech? Yes, I did. Ah, nice. You start listening to yourself. Which change did you produce in your speech? Um, Self-observation. I'm trying to say that. No, you replaced one verb with another verb. Did you notice? Yeah, I feel, then I said, I observe. Okay, you see, it's a very important shift. Do you agree? Yes. Which, which shift? Is. Which shift? What's the importance of the shift here? Um, that I'm not tricking again. No. Not. <laughs> I made you nervous. Don't worry, it's not a, it's not a trick. It's not a trick. Okay. okay. You, <laughs> I made you nervous with this tricky stuff. No, you went from subjective, I feel, your yeah, objective yeah, yeah. at first you said it's only my feeling and after that you said no no it's more than a feeling i observe it yes okay yes yeah? Yeah. okay and you say i observe that uh, interrupt pe interrupting people can be rude or perceived as rude we're good yes okay but now do you think i will agree with you or not Yes. Okay. Me. So we're very good. We agree. It's rude. Is there a problem? <laughs> no. Okay. So, but there is one. You don't see one? If it's rude, what's the immediate question somebody's going to ask? Why are you interrupting me? Let me finish. Yeah. No, but if it's rude, then why the hell do you do it? You know? Yeah. See, so being rude is negative. So if we conclude on something negative, we got a problem, yeah? Yes. And, and plus it's your problem, but you don't go all the way with it. Because that's what you think, right? Yes. Okay, yeah. So see, so, so then if it's rude, 
Why the hell do we do it? Because it is beneficial anyways. It's not about being rude here. Okay, and why is it beneficial? What we answered in the first question that it is. What it is more it helpful. It's yeah, more help. helpful to become, to focus on a concrete issue than beat around the bush. All right, yeah, exactly. Huh? And that's exactly the problem we'll have with people. That's why at first I take a bit of gloves, I'm careful, and I hope they will accept. Uh, so they see that it's a condition for the dialogue, yeah? And by the way, if somebody cannot take it, if it's beyond him to take it, I think he'd be better with a psychologist. You know, if somebody cannot accept to be interrupted, it makes him so upset. I mean, of course, there are ways to do this. You try to, you know, be, be careful. But if somebody cannot take it, then it becomes a psychological issue. Any rational person can accept and say, wait, stop. I don't understand. I don't know where you're going. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you make a wager on the rationality of the person. So even though it's not exactly pleasant, you can get over with it. Yeah. Yes. Thank We're you. good? Yes, we are. So let me ask you my ritual question. Did you like our dialogue or no? Yes, I did. Tell me why. I answered my own confusion. Your own? Confusion. But why you insist that? You, did you seem confused? Initially, I was. I felt, you... I, I felt that elaborating an issue is a better medium than just fix focusing on a concrete problem. But now I agree that it is more beneficial to focus on one problem. All right. Okay. Yeah. And what surprised you the most in our discussion? I was able to reflect about myself. Yeah. How I was hiding behind words and you pointed out very rightly. Yeah. And have you ever noticed that are you hide behind the words? No. But now that you think about it, does it make sense? It does. Yeah. And here I have to tell you, it's a very important thing. Now, when I have a, let's say, normal client, I don't start explaining that. But since you're interested in the method, I'll explain to you. It's, a, it's an idea of Sach and other phenomenologists, uh, which is working on the difference between pre-conscious uh, sorry, pre-reflective consciousness and reflective consciousness. Did you ever hear about this or no? No. Okay. Pre-reflective consciousness is the fact we know certain things happen to us, but we know it intuitively. We feel it. We have emotions. We have impression, but uh, it's not fully conscious. When reflective consciousness. You conceptualize it, you name it, you analyze it. And in our work, we make a pre-reflective -consci pre consciousness into a reflective consciousness, yeah? With the idea that you know in some way you do this, but you did not identify it and think about it, yeah? And when I ask people, what did you know? They say, well, they say yes, they say no, because in a way they knew and didn't know at the same time, yeah? Uh -huh. Right. So, but once we name it, at first they're surprised, but then they think about it. Oh, yeah, now that you mention it, yeah, you know, you understand this distinction? I do, yes, yes. Yeah. And that's a very important aspect of our work, huh? to this transformation from pre reflective to reflective, yeah, by naming and by analyzing. Good? Yes, thank you so much for that. Did you suffer? Uh, <laughs> uh, no, it was a little relaxing, rather, I would say. Yes. To be very clear and direct. It, it, exactly. And that's the point, you see. It might look rude, and it, but if you go all the way, after that, it's relaxing because you realize uh, we're anxious about nothing. Yeah? Good? Yes. <laughs> but, of course, initially, or from outside, people say, oh, my God, this is terrible. This, no, it's... it's it's a relax. I think it's a relaxing exercise if we accept, if we surrender and we accept to go with it. Yeah. Good. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, have I have. Questions. Yeah. Yes. What? Uh, I have, have a some question in the chat. Yeah. But before I have a practical question, 
uh, uh, I don't know what the habit you guys have. Do we give a little like 10 minute break or we go all the way because we have three hours in your habits? What do we do? Have a little break or go on? Yeah, in fact, we have, uh, we have completed two, almost two hours. We are completing two hours, uh, Oscar. I think yeah. we should give 10 minutes break for our, uh, for, you know, so that okay. we can come back uh, uh, after 10 minutes. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. So we give 10 minute break, 10 minute break and we come back. Yes. Okay. Yes. Very good. Yes. Great. Okay. Thank you. So friends, uh, take a break and come, come back again. <laughs> we'll meet in 10 minutes.